Get it together, girl. I feel like the testament to how much Audrey likes a book. Just look at the dog earring. Let's watch me live math. This is gonna be embarrassing. If you enjoyed Hairpin Bridge, I've heard it both ways. Anyone a psych fan? And I, ooh, did you hear that crack? Completely freaked me out. I don't know that I've ever say I was like, I'm so mad I read this book. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to part two of what I read in April. So I'm very happy to say I had a really good reading month. If you missed part one, I will link it for you guys. If you're curious what I read, curious, <laughs> I read a flaw in the design by Nathan Oates. I'm trying to do a little bit of a recap in case you guys missed it. All Good People Here by Ashley Flowers. Maybe you wanna see the front of the books. I read Geneva Rose, You Shouldn't Have Come Here. I read Peter Swanson's All the Beautiful Lies. And then I read Happy Place by Emily Henry, which at the time my book had not come yet because I had an ALC, but here's the physical book. And I had a great start to April. And I'm very happy to say I had a great finish to April. So if you guys have been following my journey, you know I have been leaning deep on into the audiobook, a trend that has continued and I'm not mad about it. So I have a mix of probably more audio than physically reading. I'll let you know what it is when we get to each one, but I have seven more books to talk about, I think. Um, yeah, I have seven more books to talk about. So without further ado, let's get into the books. Okay, not a lot of strategy with how I'm gonna talk about these books, but if you guys have been around my channel, then you know I am a diehard fan of Peter Swanson. And if you guys are new to my channel, would love to have you <laughs> subscribe and be here for a while. Uh, we talk all the things, all things books, and then all sorts of ram random ramblings. But for my longtime watchers, or if you just caught a random video, you would know that The Kind Worth Killing is one of my favorite books not just to Peter Swanson, but of all time. This is the first of his books that I read and I actually reread it, actually. I don't know why I'm saying it that way. So the sequel, The Kind Worth Saving, came out this year and I wanted to reread this one before I read this one. That's just how I roll. So this time around, I actually listened to the audio of The Kind Worth Killing. So I'm gonna be pretty light on plot details in both of these books, but this is Strangers on a Plane and we have Lily and Ted meet at Heathrow Airport. They are both on a flight back to Boston. Their flight gets delayed and they wind up meeting at the bar. And they are each having a couple of drinks. They start chit-chatting and kind of revealing secrets because there's no one safer than a stranger to tell your secrets to. And Ted confesses that his wife is having an affair and he basically is like, I could kill her. And Lily is like, I think you should, and I'm going to help you. So they board the flight back to Boston, and that is how the book opens. So I loved everything about this book. And it just totally took me by surprise the first time I read it. I was so into it, so into his writing, the storytelling, everything about this book. I'm not going to say anything else about the plot because I don't dare... I just, I just don't dare. So this time around, I actually listened to the audiobook of it, which I think I just said. So audiobook narrators, they're always listed down below, but there are four narrators for this one. So we have Karen White, Johnny Heller, Keith Sarabaka, I'm totally butchering that one, excuse me, and Kathleen Early. So I will say I did not, and this is like a perfect conversation starter, maybe. This could be an entire video. I didn't love all of the audiobook narration on this, and I feel like it didn't give me the same feeling of certain characters that I got in reading them. And had I listened to it before I read it, that might have been a totally different story. But there was one narration in particular I just didn't connect to, but I loved all of the characters in the physical book. So grain of salt, but if you are listening to it and you're finding you're not connecting with it, I would urge you to try and read it because it's really such a great book and should not be missed. And then The Kind Worth Saving, I'm not even gonna tell you who is in book number two. So we get some old familiar faces, we get some new faces, we get some new mystery, and I really loved it. And I, like, again, I didn't know where it was gonna go. I didn't know where he was gonna take the characters. Both of these books are set in and around Boston, which is such a sweet spot for me. So I did love that. And I, ooh, did you hear that crack? And I, ooh, my gosh, that was like the spine of the book. I actually physically read this one. <laughs> it was so great to be back with these characters. 
and I really liked the relationships as they developed. I was, again, I was not sure where we were going. I really enjoyed Peter Swanson's storytelling style and I was very happy with it. So this is a case of, these books were written many, many years apart. This came out in 2023. Let's watch me live math. This is gonna be embarrassing. This came out in 2015, so that's eight years. Fast math. <laughs> so this book did not need to have a sequel to it, but I also wasn't disappointed because I didn't mind being back with these characters. So I'm a huge Peter Swanson fan. I have two books of his left to go. And there's going to be an upcoming video about some more pre-orders I pre-ordered because at the back of this book, I found out that he wrote a Christmas book and I totally pre-ordered it. So it's called The Christmas Guest. <laughs> Love that there's an ad in the back of the book. So it comes out in October and I absolutely can't wait for it. So he is a diehard. I am a diehard fan of his. He's an autobiographer of mine. These books are amazing. The next book I have is The Last Thing He Told Me by Laura Dave. So I did the audiobook of this. This was read by Rebecca Lohman, and I really loved this book. I really, really did. This is a case of I picked up this book when the hype train was high, and I just didn't read it because I don't make TBRs, I don't make reading plans, and a lot of times if a book is not smack in front of my face, I just don't do it. So done with the excuses. But this is a short term mini series. That's not what you talk about it. This is a made for TV series on Apple TV right now. And I was like, all right, I want to watch it, but I'm going to read it first. So I read it and I loved it. So I think part of like a challenge that some people have with this book, this sort of falls into the trap of being called a thriller. And I think when you were talking about a book like this, and then we're going to get here in a minute, and then you talk about a book like this by Taylor Adams and call these both thrillers, there is nothing similar about these books. This to me is character study. It is slow burn. There is some mystery to it. This I would put more in the category of Defending Jacob by William Landay, which coincidentally enough also has an Apple TV series. But this is so much about the characters, what they will do for their family, their pursuit to find the truth. And it's a very slow unfolding in the book. So I really, 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 really loved it. I read Laura Dave's debut novel, London is the Best City in America, which I absolutely loved. That again takes place, not that this does, that book takes place over the course of a wedding weekend and it's really so much about the characters and their emotions. So I'm a big fan of her writing style. So in this one, what's it all about you ask? In this one, we are following a woman named Hannah. So Hannah has been married to Owen for, I wanna say like a year. They've been together about three. He has a teenage daughter, so they met sort of flukishly. He was out in New York and they wind up falling in love over time. And she winds up moving to Sausalito. So him and his daughter live on a houseboat in Sausalito. I'm super familiar with the area, so I very much enjoyed that part of it as well. And when the book opens, Hannah is like coming out to the mailbox, leaving her, like coming up on the dock. And this girl that she's never seen before hands her a note. And she's basically like, your husband asked me to give you this. And she opens the note and looks at it and all it says is protect her. And Hannah is like, what is going on? Like, who are you? At first she thought it was like her stepdaughter's friend or something like that. She has no idea what's going on. She's trying to call her husband. She can't get in touch with him and he has just disappeared. So this becomes a quest for her to find out what's happened. The police have shown up, the FBI has shown up, and sure enough, she's found out that her husband has been keeping secrets from her. And she knows that in this somewhat cryptic note that she's received that says protect her, it's all about his daughter, Bailey. And she is going to do anything and everything she can to protect Bailey. And in a not surprising, my dad has married somebody new after we have been together because her mom died when she was very young. She's not a super fan of Hannah's, but the two of them are forced to work together to find out what happened. So again, I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was really well done. I thought there were some really beautiful moments and lines in here. 
and I'm just a big fan of her writing. So I have not yet started the Apple TV show. I've taken a small detour into Fatal Attraction on Paramount with Joshua Jackson, which is amazing, and Lizzie Kaplan and Amanda Peet, which I'm absolutely loving, but I'm gonna get into this one as well. So I'll keep you guys posted on what I think. But I really liked this book and I thought it was very well done. The audiobook was tremendously well done as well. And even though it's not a thriller in a fast paced mode, I was compulsively listening. I wanted to know what was gonna happen next. And again, in that very same like vibe of Defending Jacob, I thought it was great. So I highly recommend it. I'm a huge fan and I'm so glad I finally read it. But again, I also subscribe to the fact that I think books find you when they're supposed to. And this one found me, <laughs> such a cheese. The next book is another reread that I did, and I reread The Night Swim by Megan Golden. So this one popped up on my Eyes in the Cover video, which I did for Book Trevor Bingo, for anyone who's playing along there. And I actually decided to read this, not for the eye on the cover, but because the next book in the series, so this follows a true crime podcaster named Rachel Crawl. The next book in that series comes out, I wanna say July or August. I will let you guys know down below. It's called The Darkest Corners or just dark corners, popping it up there. And I wanted to re-familiarize myself with the book because I read this when it first came out a couple of years ago. So I physically read it the first time around. I totally loved it. And this is one of those books where I heard so many people rave about the audiobook because we do have a true crime podcast in it and they were not wrong. So we have three narrations in this. So we have Bailey Carr, January Lavoy, and Samantha Desi, or Samantha Des, it's D-E-S-Z. Again, it'll all be down below. So we have an audiobook, we have an audiobook narration. We have three different POVs in here. So we have Hannah's POV, we have Rachel's POV, and then we have the actual podcast. And I agree, the audiobook was very, very well done. And this is one of those books where I remembered the core story of it, but there were definitely some details that I had forgotten. And I just loved being back in this world. This is definitely heavy. This is some challenging reading in a lot of ways. This is a very powerful book. I definitely cried again while I was reading this book, but I really loved it. And I think she just draws such beautiful characters. So in this book, Rachel is working on a new season of her podcast and she has kind of become this overnight sensation. So kind of think like Serial and Sarah Koenig and she just sort of, you know, she's just blown up and she's kind of the hot ticket with the true crime podcast. So she has decided to follow this case in North Carolina and she is podcasting live as this trial unfolds. So in this one, it is a rape trial and we have a local, a local golden boy, swimmer destined for Olympic greatness. And he was accused of raping the beloved granddaughter of the police chief. So there is an element of Chanel Miller and Brock Turner to this. So there's a very timeliness, timely nature to this. There is definitely some difficult content in this, so be aware of that. So because we are following a court case, we obviously get court case in this. I do love a trial. And then we are also getting a bit of Rachel's investigation. And then kind of the added twist to this is while Rachel is in this town, she very early on gets a note on her windshield from this girl named Hannah, who was asking her to investigate her sister's death from about 20 years ago, because it was ruled an accident that she accidentally drowned and Hannah doesn't believe it. So in Hannah's timeline, we are getting what happened in the past with her sister, or in Hannah's point of view, I should say. And then in the present, Rachel is juggling sort of this past timeline, this girl who died in the past, as well as this trial that's happening in the present. So it's very well woven together. I realize I made it sound like there's a whole lot of stuff going on in here. There's a lot going on, but in a very good way. And I think the story comes together beautifully. I think she weaves the, the points of view together just really beautifully. And again, it was just a very impactful book. And I really, really loved it. I'm a big fan of Megan Golden and her writing. Her first book, The Escape Room, was one of my favorite books. And this one is, has a much different feel to it, but it's still just beautiful writing, great characters, great mystery woven in. And I was totally hooked. So I highly recommend it. And I'm really excited. I do have an e-arc of book number two, so I'm very excited to dive into that. And again, I will have the details down below when it's coming out, but so glad I reread it. I'm just such a massive rereader. 
did not disappoint and I didn't think it would. The next two books I'm also going to talk about together because they are companion novels. So the first one is The X-Hex by Aaron Sterling and then the second one is The Kiss Curse which is book number two which I don't physically own but I actually did them both on audio as well which should surprise nobody <laughs> if you've made it this far into the video. So audiobook narrators. The X-Hex was narrated by Caitlin Davies and The Kiss Curse was narrated by Shannon McManus and I very much enjoyed these books. So Erin Sterling is also known as Rachel Hawkins. She really is Rachel Hawkins. This is a pen name. I talked about this in my pen name video which would have just gone up at the time I'm filming this. So these books are romance, a little bit spicy, I would say a little bit of an edge, and I just really enjoyed them so 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 much it was like a great palette cleanser i keep teasing this i'm just gonna end with the last word <laughs> but like it was a great palette cleanser for some of the darker books i was reading this month they were fun there's some great humor to it and i'm always here for that so if you saw my pen name video you would have heard me talk about this book already but long story short so in this one the tagline is never mix vodka and witchcraft so nine years ago, Vivian Jones nursed her broken heart like any young witch would. Vodka, weepy music, bubble baths, and a curse on the horrible boyfriend. So she had a beautiful relationship gone wrong with this guy named Reese Penhollow. He is a descendant of the town's ancestors, a breaker of hearts, and annoyingly just as gorgeous as he always was. So he winds up returning to her town, which is Graves Glen, Georgia so many so many twisty <laughs> descriptions happening here and i want to say it's like 10 years later when he comes back to town and of course things ensue so it's one of those things where like her and her cousin were cursing him they were like very newbie witches they're using like a bath and body works candle again she's drinking vodka she's just doing the whole thing completely wrong places a curse on him nothing ever happens and then he returns to town and just things are not quite right so there's great humor to this it's obviously got a bit of a second chance romance to it and it's just cute and it's fun and I had a really good time with it I, I feel like this is a case where the audiobook totally can serve a book so there's a cat in this story and I don't know if anybody watched Sabrina the Teenage Witch where she had that cat Salem who was always like so snarky and everything. So even though their cat doesn't talk too much, he does start to chit chat. But like the way the audiobook narrator is like treats that the cat's always asking for treats. I could have just been in a mood, but it completely cracked me up. And it was like a what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it was like a it's not like a gag but it was almost like a gag that carried into book number two which i just thought was absolutely great fun so mysteries abound things need to be solved people need to come together it's a little bit witchy it's a little bit small town vibey and this is one of those towns where like there's witches living amongst the mortals and the mortals don't know about the witches and they're kind of hiding their powers and again it's just great fun it's not deep and dark but it's definitely just like a completely good time. And then in book number two, her cousin Gwen takes center stage and Reese, who was our main character here, I don't know why I'm showing you the back of the book. I should put it over here because we're talking about the kiss curse now. So Reese has two brothers. So we get to hear about them in book number one and then we get to meet them in book number two. And one of his brothers comes to town and opens up a sort of magic shop across the street from Gwen's and we get a little bit of an enemies rivals situation going on. So I have to say as much as I enjoyed both of these books I liked book number two a little bit more and I think it's because in ways <laughs> to use this loosely I related to Gwen and I really enjoyed her as a character which is not to say I didn't enjoy Vivi because I totally did but there was just something about Gwen that I really connected to on a certain level and I just had such great fun with so I think they're both totally delightful books. I don't think you have to read them in order you do get I would say a nice amount of Reese and Vivi in book number two which I like. I don't always love when you get a companion novel and the character who brought you there just like disappears altogether. So I feel like we got a good dose of them 
but not too much that they took center stage in the book. So it's definitely Gwen's book. And I really loved it. I hope that there's a third book in the series. I haven't actually looked to see if there's going to be, but I very much enjoyed it. So one of the things which I is not story related, but I enjoyed more about the audiobook also with book number two. So Reese and his family are from Wales. In the first book, the audiobook narrator did not give them an accent in the book, but in book number two, that audiobook narrator does. And I am trash for a good accent. So I very much enjoyed that. It just sort of elevated a little bit. But again, a little bit of smut, nothing too out of control, but like just the right amount. It's, it's funny, it's witty, it's smart. And then I should mention the cat's name is Sir Percival, like P-U-R-R, -R, Sir Percival. And I saw like every time the treats, like it just cracks me up even just thinking about it. But there's just such funny, good times in these books. And if you've read Rachel Hawkins' other books, they're not like dark thrillery like those. So if she maybe wasn't for you with those books, maybe this is more your cup of tea. Or if you're just like down for a good romance, I definitely think they're a good time. So highly recommend them both. Great fun. So happy I read them. And last, but in no way least, is The Last Word by Taylor Adams. So this is the arc of the book, which I was very, very lucky to get, which I was excited about. So I read this before it came out again, you guys. I feel like the testament to how much Audrey likes a book, just look at the dog earring or the tabs. If I'm in a tabbing mode, because I, I, I've heard it both ways. Anyone a psych fan? I also love to tab up a book. But anyway, we're here for The Last Word by Taylor Adams. Okay, so if you enjoyed No Exit, I think you're very much in, like on brand, you're going to enjoy this. Hairpin Bridge, same thing. He definitely has a sweet spot and he likes to play in it. So I actually saw an interview with him in that online author event space called The Back Room, which I've talked about before, which Karen Dion and Hank Philippi Ryan started and host, it's like every other Sunday. So he was on it last weekend, I want to say, and I was so excited to watch it. So the authors come on, they talk about their books, they keep it spoiler free, but they talk a lot about their process and what they write and how they write and what they love to write. And he was talking about how he really loves books and stories and movies that are really created in that claustrophobic environment that you have a small cast of characters that you are kind of like always like upping the tension, that you are playing fair, that you have like a hero who is like on equal par with your villain, that it's not like someone who's just getting beat up the entire time and it keeps the twists and the cat and mouse and everything going strong. So this is a sandbox he will continue to play in. So if you enjoyed, like I said, his previous books, I think you will enjoy this one as well. So this one, I feel like for all of us folks here, this is about a woman named Emma Carpenter. So she is house sitting. It is an isolated house on the Washington coast. It's just her and her golden retriever, Laika. And she is just like passing time, just kind of hanging out at this house. She is a huge reader and she has a neighbor who's like, I don't know if he's like half a mile away, three quarters of a mile away. So again, the houses are very spaced apart. And the woman she is house sitting for like told her about this neighbor and her and the neighbor communicate. They each have telescopes. You know, you can look at the stars or you can look at your neighbor and they kind of communicate through whiteboards. So they play hangman, they exchange messages, but she's not actually out and about talking to anyone. So she's reading a whole bunch of books and her neighbor makes a book recommendation for her. So she like gets on Amazon, downloads it to her Kindle and reads it and reads what she decides is the worst horror book ever. And she decides to hop online and leave a review to let everybody know worst book ever. And then the author of the book writes her back and is basically like, you need to take down this review. Like you are going to hurt other people. You're hurting me. No one's going to pick up my book. You're costing me my livelihood. I put so much time into this. And they get into a little bit of an online battle. And she's kind of like, no, like I'm leaving it up. And then really, really weird stuff starts to happen. <laughs> She's trying to decide if the author who writes these dark and messed up books that she just read about killers and stalkers and all these terrible things is actually literally coming for her. And this book is crazy town. So when I tell you I actually had a nightmare when I was reading this, this book freaked me out. I have a pretty good threshold for a lot of things, but every once in a while, 
there's like books that I just can't read at night. And I found out very quickly, this was a challenging book for me to read at night. It really freaked me out. I didn't take very long to read it. It's compulsive. It was a fast read. Shame on me. I didn't put my dates in the front. I'm usually really, really good about that. I would say I probably read this over the course of like three, maybe four days. The, <laughs> there's some stuff that just freaked me out. <laughs> but I was a huge fan of Emma. And then I will say, because Taylor Adams has said this on his Instagram page, he has said it publicly. I don't think this is a spoiler in any kind of a way, but for anyone who's concerned, nothing happens to the dog. And what he talked about in the back room is while he was writing this book, and I love this as like an inside the author's studio bit, he himself has a golden retriever named Laika, and he wanted to write a dog in the book. And he was like, well, for now, I'm just going to plug Laika in and I'll change it later. And by the time he finished the book, he was so attached to it and he left it. So this was his own dog, like in real life. Go on his Instagram page. You can see him with his dog. There's no way he was harming his own dog. So if you were worried about that, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Beyond that, I'm not gonna, I can't tell you anything, anybody else is safe. So I very much enjoyed this book. I thought it was great. He definitely makes me look at certain things in a different way. I feel like, again, if you've, if you've read No Exit, like if, if you know, you know, <laughs> it's just like, ugh. But he manages to turn just regular everyday things into absolute nightmares. And he completely freaked me out. Completely freaked me out. But... I would still say, read the book, read the book, read the book. So we do get a book within a book here. It's dark and twisted. It's everything that if you've, again, been around my channel for a bit, everything that I know and love. And I just thought it was so smart, so smart. It definitely, I'm not one to go online or anywhere and destroy somebody's book. If a book doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for me, but I'm not here to destroy somebody else. And if I was, you can bet I would have thought twice about it after reading this because <laughs> it's just authors behaving badly, but like, oh, it's, it's just, oh, again, as a reviewer and a reader, it hit home in a totally different way, but I absolutely loved it. Thank you so much again to William Morrow for sending this to me. I just was just so blown away. I'm such a super fan of his and this was great. So that's gonna do it for today's video. That's gonna do it for the rest of what I read in April. Like I said, great reading month all around. Super excited about these books. I am so shouting from the mountaintops about audiobooks. I just am such a fan. They have just completely game changed me for the last couple of months. So trying to work on my writing a bit more. I would say it has definitely been a bit of a bumpy ride. Life has been a bit of a bumpy ride. Like everything's fine, but just like life gets in the way and you can't always sit down and dive into a book. So I will say my audiobooks are definitely keeping me out and about on the road, getting my walks in and they're keeping me great company. So on that note, let me know what book you read in April or any books you read in April, favorite books you read in April, books you're looking forward to reading whatever you want to say, let me know down below. You know the drill. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't yet subscribed and you would like to do that, love to have you. That would be absolutely amazing. And as always, I will see you guys in another video really soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.